All right, welcome to Okta's Ask Us Anything uh, Developer Edition. So there's three of us online today. My name's Randall, I'm gonna be your host. Uh, I work at Okta, I am the head of developer advocacy. Uh, our other two special guests today is first off, we have Aaron Parecki, who is a senior security architect here at Okta. He's also uh, one of the authors of the OAuth and OpenID Connect protocols and has done a ton of fantastic work in the security community there. Um, then we have Keith Casey, who is a really well-known API security expert, and he is officially an API problem solver here at Okta. So I think I got that right. So first of all, welcome, Aaron Keith. You guys want to say anything to kick us off? Thanks for having us. Looking forward to it. I'm <laughs> happy to answer any, any questions about OAuth stuff today. That is definitely what I spend most of my time on these days. Cool. And Keith, how about you? Yeah, yeah look. Looking forward to uh, kicking around some ideas and seeing how we can help some people out. All right. So the format of this is really casual, just so you know. So if you're watching this online, first off, thank you for coming. Um, secondly, we will do our absolute best to answer whatever questions you have. So whether that's OAuth questions, security questions, just general programming questions. Um, if you have any stupid questions you want to ask, what is our favorite color, for example? Uh, <laughs> we can basically try to do our best. Uh, so. With that said, uh, we actually have a list of questions that were submitted leading up to this event. So I'm gonna go ahead and get us started by just taking one of those. All right, so I think the first thing we're gonna do actually, uh, the first question we're gonna answer was submitted by Jace. So thank you for submitting it, Jace. And the question is, what new features do you all have in the works? And so Keith, I think I'm gonna let you take that one. So take it away. Cool. So uh, thanks for asking, Jace. Uh, first of all, I have to give all the caveats because we're publicly traded and everything. Um, that the, the things we have in the works, timelines tend to shift just because priorities shift and things like that. So, um, But no, we're working on a, a ton of things. If we go at the, uh, the high level, the biggest thing we've been talking about the last probably year or so is our identity engine. Um, and that's kind of rethinking the way we architected Okta. If you look at some of the history of Okta, we... Um, we originally made a lot of assumptions in how we built things. And those assumptions were right for the vast majority of use cases, but the, the space has changed, the use cases have changed, a lot of things have changed. So we've re-architected to change those assumptions into defaults. So now if you're happy with the way things work, you can change, you can leave that default as is. But if you're not, you can now switch that default and do something different. So like uh, some of the things we've done with that are like our hooks. So webhooks to be able to like pause the process in action, like authentication, make a call out to another system, and then come back and with that response. Um, and then things like event hooks after the fact, um, that's allowed us to plug in all kinds of things like identity proofing. So if you're in a like a high security environment of like making sure like this is really Randall when it when somebody named Randall signs up for the account. <clears throat> Um, yeah, and all the, the things go along with it. So it's really fun to, to do that. And then we're doing stuff all the way down to the protocol level. So there's the things like the uh, the device grant type, which in OAuth, which I believe was finalized last August, I want to say, you know, that we're working on that. That's on the roadmap. We've got uh, token exchange, which I think was January this year. That's on the roadmap. Um, lots of bits and pieces all over the stack. And just to confirm, you are not telling people to buy or sell OctaStock based on these things, right? Uh, <laughs> or any correct. I don't, when when, when I should don't I buy talk my about OctaStock, Octostock again? at all? <laughs> okay. I, I, just, yeah, just good question. <laughs> I think yeah, you should follow your, your, your investment advisor's advice. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic disclaimer. Uh, so, Jace, thanks, man. Um, if you have other questions or need a follow up, just post in the, the chat room so we can get you sorted out. All right, the next question was submitted anonymously. <laughs> so it's sort of a funny one. It says, do you ever look at feedback from customers? And the answer is no, absolutely not. We completely ignore all of our customers. That's why we do these ask me anythings, uh, because we do not want to answer your questions. But no, seriously, in all seriousness, we have a really great group of user researchers that conduct research on users using the products and get feedback that way. We also have a really active community of Okta users who send us feedback and ideas. And we definitely take those things seriously and we prioritize them. And it's a real core part of our product development lifecycle. So good question. Um, all right, next question, let's see. Uh, this one might be slightly complicated. Um, Keith, I'm gonna give this one to you as well, but it's basically how do you easily migrate on-prem database credentials 
into Okta. So I'll let you start. I might chime in with some stuff too, because I've worked on this quite a bit. And then we'll uh, take it from there. Oh, it's just copy and paste. It's uh, no, uh, <laughs> the, really it depends on like what the algorithm is and what the workflow is. So we've got a lot of capabilities around um, like during the authentication process itself, like pausing the authentication with like one of our, our hooks, pausing the authentication, validating it with the original data source, whether that's a uh, on-prem local database or whether that's like an active directory kind of thing or even another cloud identity provider or whatever. Authenticate there. Now we still have the raw credentials and then go ahead and create that user on the Opta side of things. Um, that's kind of the what we call JIT or just in time sort of user creation. Um, but realistically, if you have access to the underlying hashes, I hope they're hashes. I hope they're not plain text. But if you have access to the underlying hash, hashes, we can import, I don't know, seven or eight different algorithms um, and create users out of the box. So it's actually pretty straightforward. Yeah, so I'll also add one other thing. Uh, I'll share my screen real quick just because. Here you go. If you look up, if you just Google Okta user import API, we'll land on our user API here. And you can create a user using an import hashed password, which is what Keith's talking about. So you can go here and look through the API documentation. It's pretty simple. And there's a bunch of information on here about what hashing algorithms we support out of the box. Uh, and then there's other ways to do it for ones that aren't supported. Um, and then the final thing I'll quickly mention is that we are in the future We've already started doing a little bit of planning for this, but we are going to be releasing an open source uh, tool that you can use to m help migrate any relational database user information like into Okta. So it'll handle a lot of those API calls for you and figuring out what type of hashing uh, you're using and like moving things over, et cetera. So that is something we're going to be working on in the future. Uh, so great question. Um, next up, uh, Aaron, I'm going to pull a question for you. This is from Seismon. Uh, I'm hope I hope I am saying that right. And the question is, given the OAuth2 token exchange draft has expired, has Okta made any advances in implementing some kind of a token exchange mechanism that allows a client with the token audience X to exchange the token for another token with audience Y? Um, first off, Aaron, I'll let you comment on that if you have any ideas, and then I might add a little more context. Yeah, I, um, I'm. the draft didn't expire. It turned into an RFC. So if you're looking at the token exchange draft, like one of the one of the numbered ones, I think it got up to like 15 or 16 or something, um, then uh, it looks like it expired, but it's because it got turned into an RFC. So it is done. Now it is complete. Um, so with any luck, we will hopefully be supporting that soon. But I have zero idea about that. Keith might have an idea about the product side of it. Um, so I'll kick it over to him. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so yeah, it, that finalized, I believe it was in January. So it, it's definitely roadmap. There's uh, three or four different use cases laid out in the, the actual token exchange spec. I forget which ones we're prioritizing. Um, but we're actually collecting feedback from customers to understand like which ones come first. So back to, yes, we do collect feedback from customers. Uh, we found that <laughs> yeah, we found that most of the time, like not every use case is valuable. Uh, so we really try to get feedback from customers of what they actually want to accomplish, as opposed to just implementing a spec out of the box. Um, so yeah, there, that's that's sort of the mindset with that. That's a really good point. Right. I think that kind of speaks to in general how we how we approach it, which is just because something is a spec doesn't mean we're going to implement it. We really do try to make sure that we're focusing on what customers actually are going to be using. And that does not necessarily map to every spec that exists. All because right, there's great. a spec so for everything. <laughs> great. So Seismon, hopefully that answered your question. If not, please drop a message in the chat and we'll search you out. Um, the next question is from Tim Burns. So Tim, thanks for hitting us up. Uh, and it is, can you exchange a refresh token for user information like an email? And if so, are there any articles you can recommend on using a refresh token for this? Uh, this is probably an Aaron question, but to the best of my knowledge, Aaron, and correct me if I'm wrong here, you always exchange a refresh token for an access token. And so you wouldn't be exchanging it directly for a piece of user information. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So the refresh token, its only job is just to get new access tokens. 
And what you do with the access token, refresh token doesn't really care about that. So um, there is, for example, a user info endpoint, which you can give it an access token, and it'll give you back details about that user who the access token was, was issued to. So you could use the refresh token to get a new access token, and then go fetch the user details from the user info endpoint. Yep, that makes perfect sense. So uh, also, Tim, if you're having trouble with this, I recommend you check out some of our articles on our developer site around OAuth. Aaron's written a bunch, Mike has written a bunch, I've written a bunch. Um, we have some really great guides which will introduce you to the concept of like working with these things in real world applications. So check those out. Um, they should get you started. Just literally Google Okta developer OAuth guide and you will find some of our uh, helpful, useful stuff. All right, so the next question we're gonna talk about is from Joshua Wang. So uh, Josh says, we have two completely independent websites. All right, pretty cool. We plan to integrate them with Okta for logon and identity management. Okay, that's pretty pretty great, thank you. Uh, shall we have one Okta tenant and two applications to, to support these two websites? Or is it better to have two separate tenants, one for each website? Keith, I'll let you handle this one. Yeah, it really depends on if, if you want a, a single user identity across the board. If you want separate user identities, yeah, have separate two, two separate instances. That means you'd have uh, different users, different passwords, different uh, MFA policies, different everything across the board. And then on a management side, you'd have two different places to manage everything. I'm not a fan of that approach because it just it, it increases overhead without necessarily a lot of value. I flip it around and, and say, okay, if, if they're associated brands like um like albertson's the grocery store chain is like safeway and randall's and everything like that but it's one brand have one tenant that hosts both of those uh both websites as separate applications now you've got uh one view of the user so now you can say is this user a customer on both sides um you've got one mf or you've, you've got separate mfa policies but you only have to enroll them once like you've got a lot of flexibility there um, and a lot of abilities to do stuff. So I'd recommend one org, two apps, um, just simplify your architecture. I totally agree. Uh, it's very dependent on what you're doing, as Keith said, but in general, if you can keep it simple and just have everything in one tenant, like don't, don't make things difficult for yourself, you know? So great question. Um, the next question we're gonna talk about is from Hugh. Uh, so thanks, Hugh. And Hugh says, when edits are made to a user's claims, uh, what is the best way to force their token to refresh? Should the old one be revoked? This is a very difficult question because it really plays into like what tokens are used for at a high level, which is really they're uh, a cached, um, cryptographically signed uh, blob of JSON data at the end of the day, really. And so they always have an expiration time of some sort, and that's going to determine how long they are used. Um, I think part of the answer is really going back to how are you validating tokens? So for example, if you are building an API service and you are accepting tokens into the API service and you're validating them locally and just checking the cryptographic signature and the expiration time, then there's not necessarily gonna be a way you can you know, force a token to be refreshed because it depends on how it's being validated. Um, if you are conducting something like an introspection request every time you receive a token, if you wanna fire off a request to Okta's introspection endpoint to say, hey, is this valid? What are the things in there? That will force a token refresh. And so there's a lot of different strategies you can use there. Um, I'm not sure, Aaron, if you have any other additional commentary to add to that to help you out. Yeah, I talk about this uh, in my workshops all the time. Um, I think, yeah, like you said, Randall, the best way to think about these tokens and the claims is that they are a snapshot at the time it was created, which means essentially everything in the token is uh, probably out of date by the time you're reading it. And that's like, it's best to just assume that it is stale data. And the question is just how old is it? So whatever your token lifetime is determines how old the worst case will be. So if you use one hour tokens, the oldest data that you'll have to be working, be working with is one hour because the tokens will expire, the app will have to get a new one. If you have 24 hour access tokens, then you might be operating on 24 hour old data if you're only reading data in the token. And then the other thing to keep in mind there is if you know you never want to be acting on stale data, then don't ever read the data from the access token. So you might do like a first pass of validation of like, 
is, is, this, is this access token even valid at all, which will tell you that you're not dealing with like an attacker, like a bot or whatever, right? And then after that, you might say, okay, well, I don't trust the, the user's name that's in the token. I want to actually go get the current up-to-date version. So then you might go and do introspection remote over the network to, to load in the fresh data. So it's definitely a balancing act because you can't always do one or the other because you would either always be acting on old data or you would always be slow. So it's uh, definitely so, a, it's a balancing act. I'm going to add a little a little bit of extra stuff to this question because it's a very good question. I think people have this like all the time. We talk about this a lot. So, Aaron, maybe you can give some general rules for the listeners. So, if what types of token um, expiration times should people be using in general based on the type of application they have? So, for for example, if you're building a social networking app, how long should your tokens last? Versus if you're building a banking application, like what are some just general guidelines so people have some some ballpark of what we're talking about here sure so um first of all okta has a couple of hard limits on token lifetimes that are enforced so i believe the minute the the quickest expiration you can configure is five minutes and the uh, longest expiration you can configure is 24 hours that's for access tokens um, refresh tokens can be unlimited length because those are not used those don't contain any actual data in them they're just used to get new access tokens um, so within the five minutes or 24 hour range, that's what you're working with as far as the options you get. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that uh, it's it's all these different, you, you're balancing all these different factors. So for, um, and, and risk is one of the factors. So the risk of a leak token or the risk of operating on stale data is a factor to consider. So for higher um, higher risk environments where you're doing more sensitive operations, I would go, uh, you know, tune down the knob on your your risk exposure. So, um, even within a banking API, for example, there's tiers. There's tiers of riskiness of APIs. So you might have a, a method that returns the like the list of the user's accounts and the current balances, but only the last four of their account number. That's much less risky of an operation than an operation that moves money from one account to another. So if you're going to move money from one account to another you never ever want to operate on a token that may possibly be stale data, like at all, right? So you would always introspect on that operation, but returning the list of users accounts and the summary of their current balance, it's probably fine if you're working with an hour long, hour old data, because probably no new information has been leaked. Um, so then, so that's, that's one side. And the other side of this is the user experience side of the shorter your tokens are, the sort of more interrupted the user is going to be in some way. So it's either going to surface as a refresh, which might just add a slight delay to an operation. It might surface as a full login again, and you need to balance that side again with user experience. So for the consumer apps, it would be, ex it would be extremely frustrating if you know Instagram made you log in on your phone every day. Users would just not do it. So they skew you know, they, they, they're, they're willing to take more risk to provide a better user experience by using longer lived tokens. All right. So thanks. some things Hopefully to think about. Cool. Yeah, thanks for the question, Hugh. All right, next question we're going to talk to is uh, Daniel. So Daniel asks, how do you recommend separating your dev, QA, staging, prod environments so you can test changes independently? Do you recommend separate tenants or another approach? I think our general best practice is to have separate tenants for each of those environments. Um, that is going to give you a lot more isolation and hopefully less risk that you mess something up. So we'll just go ahead and mark that one as answered. Um, all right, next question. We have a question from Igor, and Igor asks, can we use the ID token as a user's session ID? So Keith, Aaron, either of you want to take this one? Can you use the ID token as some... a user's session ID? Have, have you given some presentations on this? Yeah. So in general, uh, so I'll just sort of provide slight more context, I guess. But in general, you probably don't want to do that. <laughs> so the ID token is just a JSON web token that contains some basic profile information for a user. It's not a token that you would use to like validate someone's identity. That's not what it's for. It's basically like a convenience token where you can, without making a, an API request to a backend, grab some basic user information. And so the answer is no. The only thing you should use the ID token for is to grab basic user information, essentially, without making an API call. 
Um, Aaron, am I messing anything up there? Does that sound right to you? I mean, I think, I think that there's, um, it's not necessarily bad. I don't, although I don't know how many advantages you really gain from it. So like, it's, it's very common that most web frameworks have their own built in way to do session management. Um, so, you know, it's probably easier to just use the built in thing. Um, I guess the one advantage you would get of using an ID token as your session ID is that the lifetime of the ID token is then um, consistent across everything that's using them as session IDs. So your session lifetime becomes the same as the ID token lifetime, right? Which I, think. I guess could be a good thing or a bad thing, but uh, that's the, sort of I the difference, right? So actually, hold on, maybe I'm misinterpreting his question because I think like, let's maybe say you're I'm building- Maybe I'm misinterpreting it. Yeah, so so this is this could actually be interpreted a few different ways. So let's just clarify this. Okay. Um, so let's say you have a, 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 a single page application, all right? And so you're authenticating to Okta's uh, OpenID Connect server and you're getting back an access token and an ID token. Um, so you have this access token and ID token now. Well, whenever your front end application wants to make a request to your resource server to query an API endpoint or do something that requires authentication, you can't authenticate using the ID token. You have to use the access token, right? Yeah. And so. I think the question is slightly vaguely written here, but if you were to store in whatever session thing that is, whether it's like a server side app and you have a cookie or whether it's a, a, a spa app and you're using local storage, you couldn't use that ID token to authenticate yourself to the backend. So therefore you'd have to embed in the session when you're making that request, the access token itself in order to successfully execute that request. That was the way I had interpreted the question, but I, I'm, now that I'm reading this, I realized uh, it is pretty vague and open for interpretation, but, um, but Igor, hopefully both of those answers give you enough context to like understand, uh, what we're talking about here. And if you want more clarification, please ask, uh, and I will look for your question in here and try to get back to you. Uh, all right. So let's see what we got here. Um, Alice asks, uh, device, we have a device microservice that has two APIs. Uh, one that gets device details and one that gets a device's location. The device get details API is only accessible internally and the device get location API is only accessible, wait, is accessible internally oh, and externally. Um, we're using client credentials. Our token is built with specific, oh, this is a long question. Our token is built with a specific client company ID in it to make sure the that it is the only access, wait, sorry, this is written a little weird. The token is built with a specific client company ID in it to make sure he only accesses the devices that belong to him. Okay, so the token has a client ID in it basically so that they can match up to see what devices someone can use. I wanted to use the scope claim and add only device location to external clients and both device details and device location for internal clients. The API checks if the proper value is there to allow the call. Is this a valid use case of the scope claim? I'm just gonna go ahead and answer this because I realize as I'm reading this to you guys, the context might be difficult, but I think the answer is yes. So you can use the scope claim to embed permissions in there that you are then going to validate when you receive the token. That's probably the best way to do it. The only real concern you're gonna have is if you have permissions that are changing before the, the token expires, like Aaron was talking about earlier. So like, if you are frequently updating permissions for these devices and trying to determine whether, and it's very important, like whether or not someone has permission to do this, you're not gonna wanna trust whatever's in the scope. Uh, you're gonna want to actually reach out to the authorization server, validate the token and get back a list of the current scopes at the time the authentication mm -hmm. request comes in so that you can then authorize this user properly. So uh, there you go. Um, all right, let's see, let me pull this up. Uh, next question is from Frizana, who asks, is there a migration strategy or process in place that can be used to move configuration? So that would include applications, sign-on policies, et cetera, from a dev environment to QA and then to prod, or does each environment tenant require manual configuration? Uh, Keith, you wanna take this one? 
Yeah, there's there's actually some work going on on this front to, to make that process easier. Uh, the, the default way is to do it manually, which uh, isn't great. Uh, we also have a Terraform provider that uh, is sort of the, the level up from there. Uh, my understanding though is that the way it works is that like, however, you should use it to also configure the dev environment in the first place in order to be able to, to diff and clone that environment across the board. Uh, I haven't worked with the Terraform provider recently though, Randall, have you played with that or explored that? Yeah, it's pretty good. It covers a lot of the things he's asking about there. So check out the Okta Terraform provider. It should get you like 90% of the way, if not more. Um, and if you do have any problems with it or something's missing, please leave a GitHub issue because we are actively developing and maintaining that. So we want to make sure it has everything that you need. All right. Uh, so we do listen, we do care. Thanks for the question. Uh, next question real quick is by Paula who asks, Hey, I need to drop off in 10 minutes. Will this be recorded and where will the recording be shared? Um, Gina, I know you are here listening. I know this is being recorded. Uh, the answer is yes, it's recorded. And I believe, Gina, if it's okay with you, we're going to share this to our Okta developer YouTube channel once we are done. And that YouTube channel is youtube.com slash Okta dev. So you can go ahead and check that out later. Uh, we also have tons of other videos on there of us doing similar uh, things like this. So we do these Q&A sessions pretty regularly, I'd say around once a week. So you should absolutely go subscribe to our YouTube channel and like and all that great stuff. So thanks. Uh, all right, next question. Uh, let's see. Let's go through the list here. Um, all right, here's a question. Uh, question, excuse me, from Peter. Peter asks, "How do I create a test environment that allows me to test SAML support in our product, interacting with our customers who are using Okta as an SSO solution?" Keith, you want to take this one? I knew this was coming at me as soon as you said SAML. Uh, SAML is kind of a, uh, it's a challenging tool. Uh, so Nobody likes most that. likely, <laughs> yeah, to be polite, it's the bane of my existence at times. Uh, but no, the most likely the, the way you'd want to set this up is you'd have your, your production environment and then you'd set up a dev environment with some sort of, uh, inbound federation to your production environment so that when somebody was uh, wanted to log into the dev, dev environment, they could use the production environment and then come back to it. So you've got uh, like a, a single sign-on approach. And at that point, then you could, um, you should be able to start the login process in your dev environment, finish it in production, and then pass the results back to your dev environment and then interact with your app. Um, I'd, I'd have to check out the configuration to, to be more specific, but I think that's a general pattern that should work for you. Yeah, and if you have any deeper questions there, Peter, hit us up. We'll try to get back to you with more context. Um, next question is from Paula. I think this is the same Paula who has to leave, so hopefully you will look at this in the recording later. <laughs> but uh, she says, hi, I have a product that requires our customers to install an executable, an executable that we provide locally and we expose APIs through Azure's API management. And we want to secure those APIs using custom scopes, uh, AKA custom ac access tokens minted via Okta. What is the best flow for those remotely installed executables to retrieve, oh, to retrieve and present, hold on, and present access tokens since there is no human identity involved? If the APIs were not publicly exposed, we could use the client credentials flow. We just want to make sure we don't expose the client ID or secret within that executable that is installed at our customers' locations. Um, Aaron, this is a really common question. I'll let you take it. Oh, I, I that was so long. Which one yeah. is this? Okay, I need me, to read it. Let me let me reprovide the context. Basically, her yeah. company builds an executable that her customers install on like a computer, and they're trying to figure out how can that executable. Um, make authenticated requests to their Azure API services that power it behind the scenes without embedding a client ID and client secret in the executable itself. Right. Yes, that is a problem. Um, you basically can't ship the executable with a client secret. It just won't, not, not possible. Um, so the you have to do an actual OAuth flow and get a user to log in to that in order to get the access open into that device. So um, this is what's, um, this is, let's see, I have a blog post on the Octa Developer blog 
of, that talks about embedding secrets in mobile apps or native apps. Um, so that's a good reference for that talks about this problem and why it's a problem. Um, the solution is to do an OAuth flow that does not require a client secret and um, boot, bootstrap it that way. So get the user to actually log into it. Uh, unfortunately, you can't actually just and, ship it. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen real quick, by the way, too, and show you Aaron's blog post he's talking about here. So it's called Why oh, OAuth thanks. API Keys and Secrets Aren't Safe in Mobile Apps. So um, just Google this, check it out. You will find it on our developer blog. It's, it's really awesome. We just wrote it. Uh, not too long ago, so you can read through and get all the information. So oh, thanks, even though there's no human identity information, in, human identity in, involved in this, you do have to get a user involved to log in to sort of enroll that device. So let me play devil's advocate for a second. So what if the APIs that uh, Paula is protecting here, they don't have any human context or like anything like that, and maybe they just want to keep them generally safe? but like it's not 100% required. Would you say that mutual TLS is another potential option here? So maybe the application ships with its own SSL certificate that is whitelisted by the server side API so that they can communicate securely without like someone using Charles proxy, intercepting the request traffic and then manipulating it or what have you? I mean, it's, I mean, it's the same, same problem at the end of the day. Like if you ship a certificate in the app, someone could decompile the app, extract the certificate, and use it themselves. Um, and there's no real way around that. So if you are OK with that being the amount of effort someone has to put in to hack the API, then use that option um, if you're willing to, to take that risk, which is slightly better than a publicly exposed API. But uh, just know that it is not actually you know, secure. Someone can reverse engineer it. Uh, but it might just be you know more work than anybody's willing to do to actually reverse engineer it. Yeah, the unfortunate thing about that is that that's that's kind of the baseline on what most people do. Uh, we were working with somebody last year, Alyssa Knight. She's fantastic hackers hacker type of person. She got uh, she downloaded thirty apps from the. Um, the, the Google App Store and found that mobile apps, I think 29 of them had credentials embedded in them, whether that was AWS, like S3 read write keys or APIs, like uh, yeah. API keys, things like that, like read write access to all these different services. So, um, Paul, I know you're, you're struggling with this, but that a lot of people are, but you need to have some sort of user identity. You can't ship secrets in these, these apps, whether it's mobile, native, whatever, it doesn't matter. You just can't do it. You're opening yourself up for a world of pain. All right. Well, mm -hmm. thanks, guys. Uh, next question is from Bob. So Bob asks, SAML 2.0 question here. How do you recommend implementing e-signatures? We want to challenge the user for their password during an SSO session, but we're not sure how to submit the ID and password to a SAML endpoint. Thanks. Keith, I know SAML is your favorite protocol in the whole universe, so like, I'm going to let you take this one as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to respectfully decline this one because honestly, I, I don't have a clue. Um, okay. I, I suspect it'd be related to like like resetting the SAML flow or revoking it, uh, whatever. But I'm not I'm not sure of the mechanics. Uh, yeah, so I have basically zero expertise with SAML except for like how not to use it. So uh, unfortunately, m my input is useless here. Aaron, how about you? Nope. Nope, no idea. Right. I, I avoid SAML at all costs. So, so we have run into the boundaries of where we can answer your questions, everyone. So we apologize. Uh, so next Bob time we'll stumped have us all. On the call yeah. <laughs> Bob stumped us all. Do we have to like buy him a drink or something, or send him a T-shirt or something like that? I'm sure we can make something happen, Bob. If you if you're still watching <laughs> this, uh, send an, send your address and your T-shirt size to evangelism at octa.com, and we will get you sorted out. So thanks. All right, uh, next up, uh, we have, have a question here from Josh. All right, Josh says, uh, let's see, this might be a long one. Oh, there we go. If we use Okta to support both externally facing web applications where the user accounts are stored in Okta and internal web, uh, web applications where the users are our employees, excuse me, and we plan to integrate Okta with our Active Directory to support SSO, will the same pricing model apply? Now, I don't know much about our pricing. Uh, Keith, do you know a lot about our pricing? Like if the internal <laughs> users are priced separately than the external users? 
Yeah, they, they generally are. So the way we look at the world is that there, there's trade-offs between internal or what we call workforce use cases and customer use cases. So uh, the external customer use cases are price based in volume, whether you have um, you know a thousand, a million users, whatever, like it varies based on that. Internal use cases are also based on volume, but the, the number is much smaller because odds are you have a hundred or a thousand customers for every employee that you have. That, that's kind of the sort of thing. And the, the capabilities that those employees need are, are radically different. So yeah, we, we vary it based on that. And the product, the underlying product is the same for both. It's the blend of it within that. So like for customer identity, we might have uh, inbound federation or, or social authentication um, and simple second factor like SMS. For internal use cases, you might issue YubiKeys to every employee. So it's a different sort of workforce and different sort of mindset there. Fantastic. All right. Next question we have is coming from Greg. And Greg asks, in a basic OAuth scenario, dot, 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 I have an API built in C-sharp that receives a token from a client and needs to authorize it against an identity server. OK, so it sounds like a use case for the token introspection flow already. I'm wondering if the API needs to be passing in credentials in order, in order to validate that token is authorized against a particular scope. Whoops. It's really hard to read the questions on here because the box is super tiny, sorry. And if those credentials from the API should have some permission scope to allow it to get that authorization response. I hope that makes sense. Mm. That does not make a lot of sense to me. Let me reread re this. I, so I think I no, I think I get it. Oh, you got it? I okay. think the question, I think I get it. I think the question is whether the act of validating the token should be itself an authenticated API call. Right. Which oh, is how the our token introspect. introspect. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So if you um if you if you have an endpoint that's gonna be you know validating the token then do you want to put credentials on that endpoint? Is that is that a good summary of the question? I think so. And uh, also, I'm just going to go ahead and pull this up. If you haven't looked at this yet, Greg, um, we have a guide for validating access tokens on our website. So if you Google Okta validate access tokens, you'll find this. And it talks about how the introspection request works. And it has all the information in here, including what parameters you have to pass in, for example, your client ID, um, your client secret, if you need if you need that. There's like a bunch of different things in here you can look at too. You might just want to check this out. But Aaron, did you have any other context to provide for Greg? No, I think that's a great place to go. That that document talks a lot about all the different considerations there. Well, I, right, I think cool. there's two different like layers, the access token here. There's I, I think the way he initially describes is that the access token is opaque. Like there's nothing actually in it. And then that gets submitted and blown up into actual scopes and claims and things like that. That 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 validation step is there. Um, which you you can do that. Lots of APIs have that where the the actual API key or token is just a big opaque string. Uh, with with us, you can also have access tokens that are actually have stuff in them. So you can have the scopes in them. So you could validate that access to token locally or hit the introspect endpoint and get a result. Caveated by what Aaron said earlier, but that, that access token is a snapshot in time. So make sure that you can trust that window, that snapshot uh, within when you actually need to take action on it. That makes sense. All right. Um, it looks like Tim has another question. Uh, Tim asked a refresh token question earlier, so he has a follow-up to this. Is it bad practice to validate a refresh token against your Okta you know, authorization server to see if that token and the user is still valid? So he's talking specifically about refresh tokens here. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, you guys, but there's not really any benefit to introspecting a refresh token because when you use a refresh token, whenever that is at some point in the future, you're going to send it to Okta anyways to get a new access token. And at that time, it will be invalidated. Like it won't be valid if it's if it's been revoked or whatever it is. So in I can't really think of a good scenario in which you would want to validate a refresh token using introspection. Aaron, Keith, can you guys think yeah, of a good I would, Well, I would rephrase this. Um, 
you shouldn't think about this as validating refresh tokens. You should think of it as using a refresh token. The act of sending the refresh token to Okta is using it to get a new access token. And then Okta is creating a new access token at that point, as well as doing whatever else is associated back in the chain of like keeping track of the fact that the user has a new access token and things like that. It is not validating the, access, the refresh token. It is using it, redeeming it. So if you think of it that way, then then the question becomes, is it bad practice to use a refresh token to check if the user is still valid? And I think that starts to sound weirder, right? That seems like that raises more flags yeah. to me than the, the, the way you phrased it, which was validating a refresh token, because you're not validating it. You're actually using it. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, um, next question is coming from Ethan. So Ethan asks, we are trying to integrate with Okta so our customers can do SSO. And their customers, by the way, are already Okta customers. So cool. Um, it sounds like we're going to be using OpenID Connector rather than SAML. Yay, that is fantastic. Don't use SAML unless you have to. Your docs say that we need to know the client ID and org URL. Is this org URL our Okta dev servers org URL, or do we need the org URL of our common customer? Um, <laughs> and to be honest, I think it actually depends on <laughs> specifically what what you're doing here, because the org that you're talking about, that org URL is gonna be for the authorization server. And so in your case, it says you're trying to integrate with, with Okta so that your customer can do SSO. And so if they're SSOing, like if, you, if they're using their native credentials to SSO into you, then it's gonna be their authorization server that we have, that you have to talk to. But if it's the other way around and you are going to be the root holder of the credentials, it's going to be your authorization server and your or, or URL. Does that, hopefully that makes sense. I realize that is a yeah. complicated scenario there, but hopefully that well, phrasing to, to, helps you. To raise it up one level, it comes down to who do you trust? Do you have to trust them or do they have to trust you? If you have to trust them, when you get that inbound token, you need to know that you, you need to have a, a prior trust relationship set up to be able to say, okay, I trust tokens from this org, from this Okta URL. Now, whether that is your dev server or their dev server or whatever, it doesn't matter. It's which direction does the trust have to flow? If you need to trust them, you need to know them in advance. Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. Thanks, Keith. All right, next question is from Joshua. He asks, can we configure our password policy to enforce newly registered users obey a new password policy while still allowing existing users to log on with passwords which which do not match the new password policy? Uh, the answer is uh, yes. So when you're using a password policy in Okta, um, it applies when people are changing their password or setting a new password. It doesn't apply to existing passwords. And if you think about it, that actually makes a lot of sense because Okta is not going to store the plain text version of someone's password. Like we hash the passwords using industry standard best practices. And so we actually don't know what the password is. And we're not going to, for example, like when someone authenticates using a bad password, we're not going to look at the plain text version and say, oh, this is invalid, like force you to refresh or anything like that. We will hash it, do the comparison, get it out of memory really quickly. So. Um, the answer is uh, yes, that is the, the only way that it works. All right, let's pull up the next one here. So uh, let's see, let's see. Oh, that question is not fully completed yet, so we'll wait for them to finish typing that one in. Okay, here we go. Uh, next question is from Farzana, who asks, is there a way to set different logging levels in Okta? For example, can we restrict the view of the system log for different users by debug, info, warning, et cetera? That's a great question. Um, Keith, Aaron, either of you have any input on that? Because I'm honestly not sure. No, I don't believe we make that distinction uh, at all. What we generally recommend for logging is that <clears throat> you plug something into it like a, like a Splunk, and then you can do the filtering on, on that layer. So we only keep the last 90 days, and we don't do anything along those lines. Great. All right, thanks. Thanks for the question, Farzana. Um, the next question, let me just read through this because it's written in two different questions on here. Um, okay, so this one says, I'm not a developer, but I'm studying for passing one of the Okta's uh, cert certification exams, and I can't find, or I can find many example SAML apps, but not many 
open ID connect example apps. Do you have examples which use open ID connect? Uh, yes. So we have a ton. So what you can do is go to actually, let me just pull it up real quick. I'll share my screen real fast to help you out. So you can go to our uh, GitHub organization. It's github.com slash Okta developer. So we have uh, hundreds of example applications on here that you can go and look through. And also go to toolkit.okta.com, which has lots of different applications that we've built. Um, almost all of these are using OpenID Connect. And you can look at the code and see how they work. You can even deploy a lot of them with one click. You can do all sorts of things here. And then finally, if you go to our website, our developer website, developer.octa.com, and click on the blog, you can also go through here and read our blog posts, which almost all of them talk about OpenID Connect and OAuth and things like that. And so there's tons of things in here you can uh, look at and learn about to see how an OpenID Connect application is built. So hopefully that helps you, and good luck with your Okta certification exam. Um, actually, that reminds me, uh, Keith, you recently helped build a new certification exam for developers, didn't you? Yeah, we just finished that recently. So tell, tell people about that, because I know it's brand new, so some, someone might be interested in checking that out, getting Okta certified, et cetera. Yeah, so uh, we, we've had like the Okta basics and the administrator and like the, the consultant certifications for years. But uh, what we started working on probably a year or so ago by now was being able to say, okay, you, you know how to use Okta from the dashboard. Let's make sure you understand how to, to plug in, how you integrate with it, how you build custom apps around it. So it gets into the mechanics of, uh, you know, ha handling tokens. How do, you, how do you make sure you do that? Handling uh, API calls, things like that. It doesn't get into like individual versions of SDKs and things like that. That's super specific and not really fair if you don't work in that language. Uh, but we really want to make sure that as you're building applications, that you're building it, um, you're building it smartly. You're building it securely. That you're protecting your customers as much as we want you to. So I also just pulled up some some information on this real quick, just in case any of you are interested in getting Okta certified. But the new certified developer program. Um, I'm just reading some stats about it. So there's no prerequisite exams you have to go through to do this one. It's a two-part exam. Part one is a 60-minute discrete option, multiple choice uh, test. The second part is four performance-based use cases. Um, and there's a really cool performance-based app that you get to use to play around with it that one of our other coworkers actually built, which is pretty great. And uh, it's going to be $250. And that goes live on August 3rd, so pretty soon, a couple weeks from now. Um, and if you want to sign up for that, it looks like the right place to go to is this right here. Just share my screen. It's octa.com slash services slash certification. So go here, August 3rd, check it out if you do want to get Octa developer certified and uh, give us feedback on what you think. So there you go. Great question. All right, let's see what we got next here. One moment. Okay, uh, we have another follow-up question about that password policy question from earlier. So can we force existing users whose passwords don't match new the new policy when the user logs on? So I, I'm trying to phrase this right. Uh, I, think, I think what they're asking is, if we have a password policy and it's very strict and someone who already has an existing password is logging in, can we force them to, to like change that password. Keith, can we, can we do that? Yeah, I believe there's a couple different strategies. The easiest one is you uh, like use a, an API or the dashboard and put them into an expired password state. And then the next time they log in successfully, uh, including whatever MFA required or whatever, uh, once they've successfully logged in, they'll be requested to change their password. Um, so that that's a, a quick and easy way to do it without sort of um, without interrupting them or preventing them from logging in next time around. All right, fantastic. Um, next, we have a couple questions from Nilesh. Hopefully, I'm saying that right. Um, Nilesh asks, and I'll just go through these one at a time so it's not too confusing. So first question, does Okta support SSO and any SSO mechanism between a native mobile app and a web application? Our website is using OIDC 
an OIDC API and our mobile application is using the Okta native mobile SDK. So they want to know, do, do we support SSO between the mobile app and the website? And the yeah, answer is well, yeah. three if Go for it. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so if you're using the, the Okta mobile SDK, uh, that's built on the app off library from the OpenID Foundation, uh, which uses the shared session cookie storage between that and whatever the native browser is. So as, assuming you're using that, then as soon as you log in through the mobile app, you should also have a session within your browser itself. Um, and then, so yes, you would be logged in at that point. Um, Let's see, I believe that's the baseline in iOS, Android, and I think there's some JavaScript support for it. I'm not familiar with that side. Aaron, did I get that right? Yep. Cool. So the follow-up question uh, Neelish has is, what is the recommended implementation between a native mobile app and a web application? Like, how do you handle, I guess, those authentication and authorization things together. Any supporting or example documentation references would help. Um, I can share my screen and just pull up some things for you real quick. But we have a lot of documentation and, and blog posts, really, that we'll walk you through. So if I, if I just Google Okta, whoops, developer. Oh. Let me share my screen. So sign users into your mobile app. This is one of our Android guides. Um, we have a blog post from a couple years back talking about using OAuth 2 and native mobile apps. Uh, we have guides talking about how to sign into a mobile application using Okta. So just Google Okta developer mobile application. That should get you references to all the different places um, where you can get some help real quick. So hopefully that's, that's useful. All right, Markdown is answered. Um, and it looks like there's a follow-up question here. Let's take um oh that's actually a, a question about our dev form stuff so i'll leave that off until later uh what else do we have uh, do keith do you have any familiarity with with workday's ecosystem i'm gonna go ahead and, and read the question but i am not at all familiar with workday so i have no idea but the question states within the workday ecosystem uh, we have some use cases where we have built-in support for oauth api access OK, sounding good so far. A lot of times, the client uses Okta for SSO, and they may have partner applications that are integrated with Okta and have a need to pull employee data from Workday. With more and more people moving towards on-demand data access based on user sessions, are there any plans to make SAML bear token integrations easier, like what you have done with worker provisioning in Workday? Do you already have the documentation around it? Again, I have no idea anything about Workday. Keith, do you? I know it exists, and that's about it. I got nothing. I'm sorry. All right. Kapilesh, I am sorry. If you send us an email to evangelismadocta.com <laughs> with your address and your t-shirt size, we will do our best to sort you out. Um, but yeah, we have no idea. The three of us are basically developers who work in the security space, and so we will try our best. But that, that answer eludes us, so we're sorry. All right, next question. And uh, looks like we've got seven minutes left. So let's see if we can finish these, these last couple real fast. So this one's from Greg. Greg asks, follow up to my authorization question. Our customer has their identity server set up so that at this point in development, the client ID and secret my API is configured with to get the authorization has to be the same as the client ID and client secret of the access token being sent, which sounds, sounds wrong to me. This was the basis of my initial question. How should the API be configured regarding client ID and client secret? Meaning, should it have its own credentials configured on the identity server and be passing them? Aaron, would you care to take this one? Yeah, there was a lot there again. Um, let me let me read this again. The one thing that that I was confused about was what it means when you said. Uh, the same client ID and secret of the access token being sent. So access tokens don't have client IDs and client secrets. Client secrets can be used to get to get an access token, but they're completely different things and they're not associated. Um, so, but the actual question is, should this have its own credentials uh, at the 
Yeah. So like you wouldn't want to have the same client secret in two different like identity servers or OAuth servers. That's that that seems weird. I would that's a password, right? And like you shouldn't be reusing passwords, which is essentially what that is. So yeah, every component should be having its own client secret. And you, you know, you treat it like a password and you only send that to the place that it came from as a way to prove you know, who you are. Great. All right, I think we have time for just about one more question here. Um, there's a question submitted anonymously um, leading up to this, which basically said, how do I maintain two copies of user data, both on-prem and within Okta? And it's a really good question. Um, it comes up quite a bit. I'm going to provide a little context. Keith, Aaron, feel free to jump in. But if let's say you're building in a traditional web application, all right, like a, a like a, a bookstore, an online bookstore, and so you have a relational database like Postgres where you store all of your user information, maybe, and then you have Okta and you're integrating with Okta. Well, ideally, what you're going to do is you're going to migrate those users out of Postgres and into Okta. Okay, and when you do that it leaves this question behind that a lot of people struggle with, which is in my relational database, I had all these objects that were tied to my users via like a foreign key relationship. So maybe in the past you had like a book, you know, table in your database that was related to a user's table in your database because a user purchased this book or maybe they wrote this book or whatever it is. And now you're trying to figure out, well, how do I relate something to a piece of data that's no longer in my database server? And basically what you need to sort of get wrap your mind around here is you want to use um the, your your okta users unique href like it's a uri that uniquely identifies it as your like identifier in your actual database so in postgres for example instead of having like a users table in your books table you would have a column for user underscore href let's say and that would point to the okta user href that way, when you want to get the user associated with a book, you query the, the books table, you get the user href field out of it, and then you use one of our SDKs, you pass in that href and say, hey, I would like to retrieve this object, please. And it will get the user so that you can then grab their information. Now, if you really want to go out of your way to keep duplicate copies of the information, so have Okta be the central source of truth for your users, and then also store a duplicate copy of that information in your own database server, you can totally do that. It's just, uh, you're probably gonna have to plug into some of our webhook calls to see when users are created and updated. Um, there's like some webhooks you can tap into there. If you Google Okta hooks API, you will see all the documentation in the world which talks about those things. Um, or alternatively, you could always write some sort of cron st style <laughs> script that will ping Okta's API, look at all the users once over every time period, and then ensure that all of those have been copied into your local database. But in general, I wouldn't recommend that because it's a lot of hassle. You don't really get a lot of benefit. I would just try to instead wrap my mind around using the user href field and using that for relationships. So hopefully that answers your question. And uh, let's see. Um, well, we have two minutes left. Let's see if I can find a real easy one here. Uh, how much more will be worked on when it comes to the Okta app? I'm assuming they mean our Okta, um, like actual mobile application. And we have a whole team of people that's, that's working on that application. So I think it's safe to say that there's lots of stuff coming down the pipeline. Um, I don't know if any of us has the exact information on that because that's not really our area of expertise, but don't worry, those things are constantly being updated. So I'm sure there's a lot more. And let's see what else we got. Uh, final question, we'll do this. What are you looking forward to seeing released that you have been working on? So Dustin asked us this question. So Keith, why don't you go first? What are you looking forward to that you've been working on? Oh, the identity engine, sort of refactoring and cleaning things up and restructuring things from the ground up is really cool. Uh, watching customers' eyes light up when they're like, wait, we could do that is kind of badass. Aaron, how about you? Um, let's see. Lately, I've been working on actually building out a, uh, or rather, updating a WordPress plugin that I wrote a while ago for integrating Okta, using Okta as your WordPress login. And it's not officially supported product at all. It's just something I put up on our GitHub. 
Um, and it turns out a lot of people have been using it and um, still working on some updates, fi fixing a few bugs, but it's pretty cool seeing everybody uh, using it. And I know for me, I've been working with quite a few other teams here on uh, revamping some of our developer SDKs, which is something I'm personally really excited about. In particular, our Python and Flask SDKs, because I'm a huge Pythonista. Uh, look for a new Python SDK coming out in the very near future. So if you check out GitHub, you can actually see the work in progress that's been uh, going on there. It's super exciting. And if you're a Python developer, uh, you know, obviously, I think that's a big deal. And it's going to be pretty cool. So I think that's literally all the time we have. So it's, it's been exactly an hour, absolutely full of answering questions. So thank all of you for coming and joining us. Um, Aaron, thank you a lot for all of your expertise and helping out. Keith, thank you a bunch as well. And uh, would either of you like to say any final parting words before we get the heck out of here? Nope. No? <laughs> All right. Well, I will just go ahead and plug stuff for you. Check out Keith Casey's book. I believe we have the link in here. It's a really great book on building APIs. Um, also, please check out Aaron's book on building OAuth applications. It is the definitive reference on the subject. It is absolutely fantastic. Um, Keith, give us the URL for your book. Aaron, then please give us the URL for your book, and we'll be out of here. Yeah, mine's really easy. It's theapidesignbook.com. Not some API design book or another one, theapidesignbook.com. Great. And then Aaron? Cool. Mine's, mine's also really easy. It's oauth.wtf. There you go. All right. Well, thanks again, everyone, for joining us, and we will catch you next time. All right. Take care.